Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. How are we doing today? Good. It's cold outside. It's the way it's supposed to be on Christmas. Y'all are like, mm-mm. It's so good. So good to see you today. Um, and what a powerful time of worship together. Wasn't that amazing? That's what I'm talking about. That's the, that's the worship our God is worthy of. Amen? Amen. Well, we want to say a great big thank you. As Pastor Bryant mentioned, the uh, Christmas gift to the world, we want to say a great big thank you to your generosity and the giving that you uh, gave for that. It's just an amazing thing. One of the things that I do want to give a little quick update on is it looks like this week that we may have found a building uh, for Midtown. And so... For three years, they've been portable, and they have grown by over 70% in one year this year since Pastor Mo and Kendra have been there. It's been an amazing thing to watch. God is doing special things there, and so thank you uh, for your generosity towards that and towards the work that we're doing there in Uganda. Uh, both of these areas of ministry are very, very blessed and grateful to you, and so I'm just pass that along to you, so thank you so much. Well, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We're going to dive in and continue in this uh, series, uh, Home for Christmas. And today we're going to talk about the gifts of Christmas. The gifts of Christmas. Um, as we dive into this time, we're, we're ending a very sp special thing, in my opinion. Uh, we're coming to the end of uh, 2019, which is the close of a year. But it's 2019, so it's not only the close of a year, it's the close of a decade. It's a 10-year decade, and when we think about it in the stand, uh, from that standpoint of it's not just the end of this year, it's the end of a decade. It, it requires of us just a little bit of reflection, a little bit of us looking back through the last 10 years uh, and looking at all that God did in our hearts and in our lives. Some of you came to know Jesus for the very first time in the last decade. Some of you have seen miraculous things in the last decade. Some of you have experienced God in new and special and fresh ways. But as we end something, how we end one thing determines how we enter the next thing. And so we want to take these next few days and these next few weeks to really take the time to focus our hearts and focus our attention. So there's a lot of words that can describe how we would end a year. Maybe it's focused. Maybe it's, maybe it's intentional. Maybe it's strong. I want to end this year or this decade strong. I want to offer a different word to you. How about let's end this decade present? Let's end it present. In other words, we are not being torn a thousand different directions, which is oftentimes our daily lives. And sometimes because we're not able to be present, we're busy. You know, you drive down the road and people are weaving all over the road because they're texting and looking at emails. They're not even present in that car and they're going 80 miles an hour. How many of you want them to be present? Yes, I do. And so we're so often so busy so pressed for time, so torn a thousand different directions that we are not present to be able to actually see, to reflect, to acknowledge what's right in front of us. I saw this uh, uh, Instagram post from a friend of ours, uh, Kendra Moman, who is the lead pastor. Uh, her and Mo are the lead pastors in Midtown. And I thought, this is such a great post. She says, hey, friend, thank you for the present of your presence. In other words, we spend so much time on the actual present that we're going to give away, but we're not always present. And what the people want from us more than anything is us. They just want us to be present. They want us to be aware. They want us to pay attention to what's going on and not blow by things. You know, I think about when the first Christmas came around. Our, there were lots of people that were so busy and so distracted and not even aware of what was happening right in front of them. The politicians didn't know. The businessmen didn't know. The, the, even the religious community didn't understand that right now a Savior is being born. God is coming to the earth in flesh. That's a significant thing. And because of distraction and other things like that, we can miss the very thing that's super important just because we're not present so I'm going to ask you to even think about how do I become more present in these last few days of this year and of this decade maybe you turn off social media maybe you put your phone in a place you can't hear it or see it maybe you sit and just sit with people and go this is kind of awkward I don't even know what to say to you because we don't really talk we text each other but we don't really like talk I'll just sit with them 
Yesterday, uh, Drew and I were sitting in the front room, and he goes, we've been talking all day. We literally had a, a couple-hour conversation just sitting there, just being present and talking about something we both care a lot about. It was a powerful thing. It was a powerful day for us. It wasn't busy. We didn't accomplish anything but a heart connection. That was pretty big. Amen? So we see this happening where people are so busy and so that they can't even see what's in front of them. I remember when Sherry and I got together. Uh, we had a friend who, who was, uh, he was a close friend of mine, and he still is a close friend of ours. He, he was a, our director. We, tra- we used to be in a traveling music group when we were in college. And uh, he came to me one day and said, you know, the best thing for you, and he was talking about for my, for my wife, he said, the best thing, the best person for you is the person you sit with on the bus almost every single day, and that is Sherry. But here's the, here's the backstory to that. He set a rule in place that we couldn't like or date anyone within the group. I mean, he couldn't keep, we couldn't help for liking one another, but we couldn't date because we traveled so much and we were in this little tiny bus and it just gets awkward when you have dating relationships in such a tight group. So we were all honoring this, this guideline that was given to us. And so when he comes to me and he goes, what do you think? I'm like, I haven't thought. I'm not supposed to think. But now that you mention it, that's a pretty good idea. So he goes to her, and the same thing happens. And initially, we thought we were getting in trouble, but he literally was our best friend. And I said, but here's the thing, Kevin. This is a rule that you put in place, and we can't really break the rule. And he said, I know, but we only have two more weeks of this tour, and then you're leaving, and you won't have a chance to connect with her. So I'm going to give you special permission to share your feelings. So we did. But if it wasn't for God using Kevin, I would have left school and never thought twice about it. And it was one of the greatest gifts ever given to me. Same thing happened on the night Jesus was born. There were a few people that were aware. There were a few people that were paying attention. The prophets knew, the angels knew, the wise men knew. There were people who knew, the shepherds knew. And the way they knew was they were present enough to see the signs, to know the time, to be aware of what was happening around them. So let's look at Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 8, it says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear, and the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that that will be with all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. One of the things that I like from my friend, Pastor Mo, down in Midtown, is he does this. He tells the congregation at Midtown, he says, lean in. He goes, lean in. So I want us to take that on up here at uh, Hamilton Mill. I loved it. So we were just down there a couple of weeks ago, and he goes, come on, everybody, let's lean in. So let's lean in. Will you lean in with me? Some of you are going... Lean in. Let's all lean in. Let's hold our hands out like this. We're going to receive from the Lord today. So we're leaning in. We're present. Let's invite the Lord to come speak to us about this season that we're in. Father, we thank you that this season we celebrate the birth of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this gift. So today, God, would you help us be present so that we may recognize, we may respond to, and we we may uh, receive all the gifts of Jesus for us in this Christmas season. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. So Jesus is the ultimate gift to the world, and and, uh, he affects our past, He affects our present, and he will affect our future. 
So we're going to look at three major gifts that we receive during this Christmas season that affect our past, our present, and our future. And the first one is this, complete forgiveness from my past. This Christmas season, you can receive, because of Jesus, complete forgiveness from your past. We all have a past. If we were to take our past, many of us would not want our past to be a video and put up on the screen so the rest of the world could see, would we? We wouldn't necessarily want that because there's things in all of us that we go, "Mm, I'm not so proud of those moments. I'm not so proud of those decisions. I'm not so proud of the way I acted here. I'm not so proud of the things I have done. But here's the thing about it. There is complete and total forgiveness for those things. When Jesus was born, it gave the opportunity for a complete remission of sin. He introduced this redemptive power between God and man. When he comes on the scene, it's because God loves you and he loves me and he loves the world so much that he wants to be with us. And in order for us to come into the presence of God boldly, we have to be rid and free of our sins so that we can come into his presence boldly. And so he made a way for that through Jesus. He made a way for us to receive total forgiveness of our sin. Luke chapter 2 verse 11, it says... For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The key word here is Savior. Unto us in the city of David is born a Savior, a Redeemer, a Preserver, a Rescuer. He's come to redeem. He's come to rescue all of mankind. But we have to understand we need a Savior. So why why is it important for us to understand that we need a Savior because we've kind of reduced salvation down to going to heaven or going to hell. Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you will go to heaven. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will not go to heaven and you will go to hell. Those things are true, but those are not the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. The purpose of Jesus coming to the earth was to redeem mankind and heal a broken relationship between man and God. The benefit of that is we get to spend eternity in heaven. But it wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to redeem and restore this relationship between God and man. And God loved us so much that he would send his son so that we could relate to him freely. So that once we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we don't, only have to, we don't only have the ability to come to God. The scripture says that we can come boldly into the presence of God. We receive grace. We receive mercy when we're there. This is the purpose of a Savior. This is why salvation really, really matters to us. So why do we need a Savior? Number one is we're not perfect. And to be in heaven, to be, spend eternity with God, it requires perfection. So if we're going to say, I'm going to work my way, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to do enough good things that will get me into heaven, you have to literally be perfect. And just a minute ago, you didn't want me to show your highlight reel, so I'm guessing that you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, none of us are perfect. And because we're not perfect, we need a Savior to redeem us, to restore us, to cleanse us, to make us in right standing with God. There was a a letter written by a young boy to Santa, and he said, Dear Santa, there are three young boys that live in this house. Nathan is two. Daniel is four. What's his other name? Norman. Norman is seven. Nathan is good sometimes. Daniel is good most of the time. And Norman is good all the time. Signed, This is Norman. (laughs) The truth of the matter is, (laughs) there are no Normans. There are no Normans. So we need a Savior. There are no Normans. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Scripture tells us. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Not some, but all. So there are no perfect people on the earth, so therefore we need a Savior. The second thing is, when we don't know Jesus and we haven't received Him as our Savior, we're enemies of God. We're literally enemies of God. 
The scripture tells us that, that, that we are enemies. We are resistant to God. And he's, there's this thing where we're working against the things of God. God's going, I don't want you to be my enemy. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to be my friend. Romans 5 verse 10 says, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We need a savior because we're not perfect and because we're enemies with God without it. So therefore, we need a savior. And the promise of our savior is this. God's promise is this, complete and total forgiveness. Well, you don't understand. You don't understand what I've done. I, I really battle with this, and I, I don't know if I can, I don't even know if I can, can, can really receive this forgiveness because, man, what I have done is really, really bad. You know what? I don't know what you've done. That is true. But I do know the complete work of Jesus, and his complete work is complete, offers complete forgiveness for your sin. Complete forgiveness. I actually had a guy come up to me after the service, and he goes, I'm really trying to work to, 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 to uh, get forgiveness from God. I said, you can't work to get forgiveness. You can't work to get forgiveness. You can only receive forgiveness. You can only receive forgiveness. We receive that forgiveness by taking the first step, and that is repenting of our sin. And when we repent of our sin, the scripture tells us that God forgives us of all of our sin. Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's sitting on the cross. He's being crucified. People are mocking him. They're condemning him. They're uh, acting contemptuous towards him. They're, they're gambling for his clothes. They're spitting on him. They're mocking him. They're asking him, if you are the son of God, then call all the hosts of heaven to come deliver you. His response was, Father, forgive them for they know not. When we look back in hindsight, we see our lives and the highlight reels of our lives and the low light reels of our lives. We can see clearly backwards, but Jesus saw clearly forwards. He saw us clean and redeemed and standing righteous, in right standing before our Heavenly Father. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, He forgives all my sin." And heals all of my diseases. Psalm 103 verse 12. He has removed our sin as far from us as the east is from the west. Hebrews 8 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. Your sin. Your iniquity. You are completely forgiven for your past. It is wiped clean. So one of the gifts of Christmas is this. You can receive the forgiveness and complete forgiveness of God. The second gift is this. Perfect peace in my present. I can have perfect peace in my present. Luke 2 verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. There is peace how many of you know we live in one of the most anxious times in history? Anxiety is through the roof. It's through the roof in young people. It's through the roof in middle-aged people. It's through the roof in older people. Anxiety is at an all-time high. There are more people taking anxiety medications than ever before in the history of mankind. Anxiety and worry and fear and all of those things are wrecking the hearts of people. Wrecking the hearts of people. Some of you in here today, you walk in, you're full of anxiety. Maybe you're anxious because you don't have the, enough Christmas presents bought yet, or they're not wrapped, or you got parties to go to, and you don't have all the stuff to get, get ready to go to the parties. Maybe you need some clothes that you don't have, and it's like, oh, all this pressure, 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 pressure. And the last thing that we feel in this moment is peace. Maybe your marriage is broken. You're not sure if it's going to make it. 
Maybe as you head into 2020, you're not sure if you'll have the job that you have today. Maybe as we look into this season, your heart is broken and you don't have peace because you have wayward children and you don't know if they'll ever come to know the Lord. Whatever the case may be, even in the midst of those circumstances, you can have perfect peace. Perfect peace. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that doesn't make sense. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. Peace is the presence of God. So if you want to to redeem your marriage, invite God into the brokenness of it. Invite Jesus to come in because he can redeem it. If you're not sure about where your job's going to land next year, invite Jesus in because he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He will provide for us. Whatever the circumstance, invite Jesus into it. It's not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of God. But the greatest enemy of peace is fear. The reason the greatest enemy of peace is fear is because fear is a prophesying spirit. Fear comes to prophesy a future without God in it. Fear comes to prophesy the future of your marriage without God in the center of it. Fear comes to prophesy the future of your career without God in the center of it. Fear comes to prophesy a future without God in it. And that'll make anybody anxious. That'll make us all anxious. That'll make us fearful. That'll make us afraid. That'll make us worry. That'll make us toil our hands. That'll make us feel like it is up to me. The old statement, the old saying, if it is to be, it's up to me. We take that on and that comes to steal our peace. There's three, three fears that come to steal our peace. The first one is the fear of rejection. The fear of rejection or FOMO, the fear of, being, fear of missing out, the fear of not being included into something. It's like at an all-time high. Social media has been one of the biggest uh, tools to, to help sow this fear in us. Because we see our friends and they're all gathered together and we go, why, why, why wasn't I invited? Why wasn't I there? And so we start clamoring, we start grabbing for, we start trying to, we start overplaying life because we don't want to be rejected, we don't want to be miss out, we don't want to not feel connected. The second fear is the fear of failure. Fear of failure. Fear of failure says I'm not smart enough, strong enough, talented enough. Key word there is enough, I'm not enough. And when I fall short, it doesn't say something about what I did. It says something about who I am. Fear of failure comes to tell you, you didn't just do something wrong. There's something wrong with you. You're not enough. That's what was happening when Jesus was on the cross. The guards were spitting on him. They were basically saying, if you are who you say you are, then call the host of heaven and get yourself off the cross. Causes us to start taking on self-protection and self-will and self, self, self instead of surrender, 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 which is what Jesus did in the midst of that. The third fear is the fear of our future. We don't know what our future holds. I don't know about you, but if you watch the news I never watch the news and turn the news off and feel peaceful. Do you? I mean, we're impeaching our president right now. We have Russian uh, spy ships on the East Coast floating up and down. I do not watch the news and go, oh, yes, praise the Lord. (laughs) That stuff is not new to our lives. That stuff's been going on since the history of mankind. There there are things that come to steal our peace and we don't know what our future holds when we see all this stuff. We don't know what it holds, but here's what I do want to say is this, that Jesus came to bring us peace. 
John 14, 27, he says, I am leaving with you a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift to the world, a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus is saying, I'm, I come to give you a gift. That gift is peace. That gift is a trans-circumstantial sense of well-being. It's not determined by what's going on around me. It's determined by the one who lives in me. It's the peace of God. We must understand that peace is the birthright of a believer. It is ours. It's a part of our birthright. It's something that, that is given to us when we receive Jesus. Real peace can only come from receiving the gift of Jesus. Isaiah 9, verse 6, one of the most famous Christmas verses out there. says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's not just one who comes to give peace. He himself is peace. He's the minister of peace. He's the ruler of peace. He's the one who comes and when he shows up on the scenes, he ministers peace, not fear. And the reason the enemy works overtime to get us into anxiety and fear and worry and all of those types of things is because he knows that he cannot minister to us in, in the presence of peace. He knows he can't minister to us. The enemy knows that. So if I can get you into a, a place where you are worried and anxious and all those things, I can lie to you. I can, I can lead you down the wrong road. I can tell you a narrative about your life that's not true and you will believe it. But when we invite the Prince of Peace, the ruler of, the minister of peace, he brings perfect peace to our hearts. It's not determined by what's going on around us. It's determined by the one inside of us. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Not because things are going on good around him, but because he trusts in you. I remember in 1996 or 97, we got the news as Sherry and I did that, that barring a miracle, we would never have children. Barring a miracle, we would never ever have children. He even, the doctor even told us, he said, infertility will increase your, or, or uh, fertility treatment will actually increase your odds by about 2%. And it is so expensive. He basically said it's not worth even trying. But barring a miracle, you will never have children. There are physical issues. That was the report. But then he leaned over the table and he looked at us in the eyes and he goes, but I believe it. I'm kind of a late processor. I, I hear things, it hits me, and I just kind of like, okay. A couple weeks later, I'm in prayer, and it starts hitting me. Oh, we may never have children. I started feeling that. It started weighing down on me. It's like a weight sitting down on my shoulders. And I remember talking to God, walking and pacing in my living room one morning. And I was, as I was praying, I was like, I only saw three options. Either God's going to work a miracle, we're going to have our own kids, or we're going to adopt kids, or God has something for us that he doesn't want to have kids, and we just don't know about that yet. So I'm talking to him about that, and I'm like, God, are we going to have our own kids? Do you want us to adopt, or do you have something for us that, that we don't have that you don't want us to have kids and we just don't know about that yet and I heard the Lord speak so clearly to me in that moment he said you will have your own we still went through the high highs of faith and the low lows of no faith we went through all the emotions but through all the emotions I held to that word because here's what I know that God is faithful to watch over his word and to make his word come to pass And so in that moment, in those circumstances, nothing changed except the peace of God inside of me. There was a peace that sat down on me. And from that day forward, I was able to keep that peace as it related to our kids. Guess what? 
We have two beautiful adult children now, but they're, there they are. They're the testimony of God to us. They really are the testimony of God to us. So here's what I want to say to you is this. I'm going to repeat to you what Paul said in Philippians 4. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is a guard to our heart and to our mind. And when Jesus comes, the Prince of Peace, he comes to guard our heart and our mind. He comes to set a, a, the word guard literally means a military guard around so an enemy cannot attack. He comes to guard our hearts. Our hearts are under assault every single day by the enemy. But here's what we can know. Be anxious for nothing, but pray about everything. With thanksgiving, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and let the peace of God come and guard your heart and your mind. So during this Christmas season, we have the gift of complete and total forgiveness. And we have the gift of perfect peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And the third thing, we, the gift that we have because of, of Christmas is the gift of eternal life for my future. We don't have to fear our future because our time here on this earth is a short time. There's eternity in front of us. There's eternity in front of us. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. He has planted an understanding inside of us that we cannot reason away and we cannot rectify in our own minds. We cannot cause this thing called eternity to go away. We all understand to some degree there is going to be eternity. But what God offers us during this Christmas season is eternal life. Meaning we will live forever. This body will perish but our spirit will live forever. Our spirit will live forever. He offers to us eternal life. The question is, do you believe in eternal life? And if you do, how much would you give for it? Because the story of Jesus can be wrapped up in the statement that John made in John chapter 3. Very famous verse, John 3, 16 and 17. It's not just something that we put on posters and and overweight men take their shirts off and put on wigs at football games and hold John 3.16 up. It's the greatest display of love ever shown to mankind. It's the greatest love ever shown to mankind. And it says this, for this is how God loved the world. He gave His only, one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This Christmas season, don't let the season of busyness, gift giving, parties, don't let the close of a year where we're worried about the end of this year and worried about the next year Let's walk into the next year present, present with God, that we can be present with Him and allow His presence to be with us. Complete forgiveness, perfect peace, and the gift of eternal life. The gift of eternal life. These are the gifts of Christmas. They're not gifts like we give. They're the gifts of heaven to us. They were given to us through Jesus. So it's not about a plastic doll in a wooden manger. It's about a savior 
who came to redeem all of mankind. When Jesus was born, the possibility of eternal life was born with him. He's the only way to experience eternal life. John 14 verse 6 tells us that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And there is no one comes to the Father except through him. No one. Today, I don't know where you are, whether you've invited Jesus into your heart or not. But here's the heart of God, and I want to read this to you. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness. But He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Eternal life required Jesus to fully lay His life down. Eternal life for us requires us to repent of our sin and to fully lay our life down. Because today we're talking about a Savior, but once we've been saved, that Savior is always our Savior, but He also becomes our Lord. And because we lay our life down, our life is no longer ours, but it's Christ. He can tell us how He wants us to live it according to His will and His purpose. Things we can see and understand and things we can't see and don't understand. But we become His. It's the greatest gift ever given to mankind. It's complete forgiveness of our sin. A way for us to come back to God and relate to Him and be in right standing with Him. Perfect peace that keeps and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus and eternal life. Would you stand with me? My question to you is this. Will you give God all of you this year, this new year, this new decade? Will you give Him all of you? Will you give Him the gift of being present, being present with Him because He is always present with us. Sometimes we're just not aware of it. But I tell you what, if we will get present with Him, we will become aware of His presence with us. Every difficulty, every hardship, every decision, every relationship, every one of those things. So I want to ask our ministry team if they will come forward and as they're coming forward I just want us to bow our heads and close our eyes and if you have never asked Jesus or received the gift of Jesus as your Lord and Savior you're saying I'd really like to do that today I want you just to lift your hand up so I can see you I can't lift it high so I can see you yes I see your hands 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 lift them high you need not to be ashamed of this. It's the greatest gift of God to you. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Let's pray it out loud. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that your obedience took you to the cross for the remission of our sin. So God, today we ask you to forgive us of all of our sin. That you would cleanse us. And Lord, today, we receive complete forgiveness from our past. And Jesus, we ask that you would be the Lord and Savior of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give God praise? There were many hands that went up in this place today.